Welcome. It's Friday. We're at our sixth uh, presentation. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, I'm excited to have Yele Faringa here to talk about robots and mass timber. I've been talking with Yele for, I don't know, more than 10 years in the world of digital fabrication, architecture, and how all of those worlds will intersect. Uh, before we kick off, as usual, I want to thank the U.S. Forest Service and the Tallwood Design Institute for supporting this series of events and our speakers for making time to participate and the participants to uh, listen to the, uh, and, the and participate in the discussions. So Yalik, I'll let you introduce yourself. You have a very long story in robotics and architecture. So if you could give more of your background and start your conversation. Sure, we'll do. So uh, in the early 2000s, I set up uh, Easy City Architecture and Design uh, Research together with uh, Philippe Morel and uh, Felix Agit back in, uh, back in Paris. Uh, but the office was drifting so much in the direction of, uh, of R&D, also industrial R&D. Easy City was the first office that, that uh, employed industrial robotics, robotics in, its, uh, in its practice. I think we were probably the, the first office to, to do so around the time. So around 2009, I started working on my PhD research, uh, which resulted in uh, Odeco Formwork uh, Robotics. Currently, I'm a CTO of, uh, of Actual, where we are gravitating towards more uh, to the parametric economy and really developing architectural products. So, you know, that's that path over the last uh, 10, 15 years will, will also provide some, some structure uh, to, the, to the presentation. So here are some earlier, so I guess it's, interesting to spend a few words on how I got to uh, getting involved into digital fab fabrication. So one of the pro projects that, that gave some uh, notoriety to, to Easy City was uh, a project where we really explored mass, mass com com computational force as a design uh, tool. So this design, this set of chair design was based on an evolutionary uh, algorithm. Evolutionary computing is a, is a subdomain of artificial intelligence. So we were really one of the first offices to, to, to explore this, right? Um, already in, uh, this project was built in 2004 already, then you could perfectly mill endless variety of, uh, of designs. The problem was more how do you generate these in a in a in a meaningful fashion, and AI is an, uh, an unbelievable, powerful and interesting uh, approach to to explore this. So keep this also in mind at the. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to this also in the in the end of uh, the the presentation since what I'm doing actually at at the moment as uh, as CTO as as actual really uh, draws back from these initial experiments that, that date back, you know, nearly, nearly uh, 14, 14 years ago. This really uh, was foundational to, to the practice uh, that, we, that we have today. So what you're seeing in this, in this video, let me, let me run it by once more, is the evolutionary process. It's a form of topology optimization, but non-deterministic. Non so from a, a set of possible chairs, uh, uh, there's uh, selection pressure. So some chairs perform structurally better than others. Those that perform get better get populated to, to a next generation. And that process is repeated generation after generation after generation. And that amounts to uh, evolutionary uh, pressure, uh, which is forcing uh, the, the, the results to, to converge, to, to optimize. Uh, a few years later, on, we also um, applied this methodology to, to, our, to broader architectural design. This is uh, the design of, uh, of the Zero C gallery, where we really, um, so in architecture, it's kind of obvious to, to design with daylight, but if you can simulate daylight with incredible precision, you can sort of 
kick in open doors, right? You can revisit these ideas with, with, uh, in a meaningful manner. The interesting thing is that this project also really set me on a on a on a digit on a course of digital fabrication. Since the contractors at the time, you know, this this project was uh, conceived around uh, 2007, 2008. Um, it was still very very, and it, even today, it's still quite challenging to create these double curve uh, curved thin concrete uh, uh, ultra high performance concrete shells. Um, so the choice at the time was, you know, uh, are we, are we going to wait and sit back and, and have the industry catch up with, with uh, the formal grammar that as architects we are interested in, or are we going to, uh, be more proactive and, and develop these methodologies ourselves. And that really harks back to, to a point of view of architecture that almost goes back to the Renaissance, right? If you, if you, if you think of Brunelleschi, right, uh, uh, kind of an arch figure in, in, uh, in architecture, I would say, the, the architect of the, of the Duomo in, the, in Florence. The thing is, you, you can't really separate the architecture from its engineering, right? So the, the, the means of fabrication, the means of manufacture, the hoists that were employed to, to uh, carry the vast, vast loads that were required. You know, the dome is the largest, uh, still today, the largest uh, spanning brick dome. So the, just the volume, the amount of material that had, had to be shoved around and carried up many, many tens of meters high was immense. So the, the, the invention of the, the hoist with a kind of gearbox that allowed the oxen that drive, the, drive this gearbox to be reversed uh, was elementary and central to the, to the conception of the, uh, um, of the drama. So, you know, with modernism, there's a kind of false schism, right? That the means of design and the means of, of manufacture are uh, no longer considered a, a design tool, right? So my belief is that uh, the creation of these, of these production methodologies, uh, these manufacturing methods is also a, a, a form of design, right? It's driven by a, a design intent, uh, right? So it's, I'm not, let's say I'm not interested in automation for automation uh, sake, but what, how it can contribute to, to the advancement of, uh, of architecture. So to think of the, of the, of what are the, are the oxen of our days is, is you know, it's really not that challenging. This is a, a, a photo taken at the um, uh, at an automotive factory in, in Antwerp, where I managed to 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 get a hold of a, of a number of these uh, uh, robots that were being sold off, auctioned off at the at the time when when many of these automotive plants were uh, foreclosing, and I shipped those to uh, to the docks of uh, of Rotterdam as part of my uh, my PhD uh, research at the Technical University of Delft. And, you know, um, um, with my research, I was really interested in, in this interface of design and fabrication, right? And, and perceiving design as a form of, of fabrication. And many methodologies at the time did not fit the purpose of, uh, of architecture that well, right? For instance, I, I assume almost everybody in this audience is familiar with, with, uh, with CNC milling, right? Where you're using a, a pencil to move, uh, to remove, to chip away at the, the, the material, right? right? Whether that's marble, uh, mass timber, EPS foam, uh, in this case, it really doesn't matter, right? The thing is, though, if you if you if you employ a, a wire rather than you know this pencil uh, of a CNC mill at chipping away at the material, 
that that uh, that opens a lot of doors because the 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 rate of material removal is 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 uh, one or two orders of magnitude faster, right? So ten to a hundred times faster. So you know there was really not that much that these twenty five year old robots uh, they could do the same task twenty five years ago, right? So. Uh, I was also heavily invested in development of uh, of software that would allow uh, allow you to to read in CAD data and automatically generate these these tool paths, right? And the more efficient your your process is, the more uh, demanding this becomes for for these software tools converting CAD data to to tool paths. Right. I mean, if you're chipping away at a marble statue for uh, for a month or two months, it's fine to to program the robot for a day or two two days. That's all right. But if you're if you're hot wire cutting like like butter through these foam blocks, you know the the two pass generation has to be instantaneous. Right. It has to be proportional to the uh, to the material processing time, which is which is in this case very very quick. So, you know, um, this software uh, development that took place also in the, under the umbrella of my PhD research provided the, the underpinning for Odico Formwork uh, Robotics, a startup which I, which I created in, uh, in, in Denmark, uh, together with uh, Asbjörn Sundegaard and uh, Hans Bunska back in 2012. And the company has IPO'd since in, uh, what is it? In the summer of 2017. So we we were really the, the first company to bridge the divide between academia and industry, and we utilized this technology to deliver, you know, many many thousands of square meters of uh, of form, you know, endless endless uh, amounts of form. So while my my PhD uh, was was ongoing. Uh, and after cutting through tons and tons of cubic meters of, uh, of foam, I also got a little bit sick and tired of it, right? And what's interesting is that, uh, you know, the logic of cutting was, was, was rather convincing. And I became really interested to see whether I could uh, apply this uh, methodology of wire cutting to just another material, right? So, uh, in that sense, the work I've done over the last 10, 15 years is, is not tied to, to, a, to a single material, right? It's, it's, I've, I've worked on stone, uh, foam, uh, wood materials, uh, many, uh, many variations of, of, of materials. But, uh, you know, when you, when you visit a marble quarry, don't don't wear a black suit. You you will look like a like an amateur. Uh, don't don't do that. So you know, I was interested to see if I could transpose this wire cutting to a, to a different domain, the, the domain of, uh, of of stone cutting. And um, there's something interesting and and uh, ambiguous about this project is that. Uh, it had a lot of support from, let's say, both the the conservative uh, end of the spectrum. They were like, "Yay, you know, natural stone, fantastic!" Because in a sense, it's it's become the processing cost of stone is so incredibly expensive uh, that it really over overshadows the the cost. Right? If you want to do something interesting, and if you're you're bringing down um, the, the cost of processing the material at an order of magnitude, it's, it's, it's a new day, right? Not only do you have new architectural uh, possibilities to explore, but they also come at a, at a different price level. So that's what I'm very, very interested in, right? And I didn't mention that uh, the, the foam cutting uh, that I've been practicing for, for a number of years is also a disruptive technology, right? You, you also need to think that this is 10 to 200 times more cost effective than, than the means of, uh, of CNC milling, right? Um, so being a specialist in, in robotics allows you to, 
uh, across the divide between the different material processing domains quite quite uh, quickly and quite abruptly, right? So before heading out to to Carrara, I, I never set a chisel in a in a in a block like marmal, right? I'm the absolute uh, dilettante. So it's an interesting reversal also of the of the of the talk of uh, Wolf of uh, yesterday from from Handedegger, where you know absolute domain specialism, world world leader in the, in that. So my approach is is far more more global, and I'm interested in engaging what is robotification, how how does it relate to uh, to to architecture, since you know high quality architecture hasn't been uh, widely distributed since labor and, uh, um, and labor the, the, the labor cult associate associated to delivering high quality architecture is. Uh, um, is really problematic for for its its wider wider distri distribution. Uh, what's pretty cool is that these technologies have really seen uh, also the, the the diamond wire cutting of uh, of natural stone has seen uh, industrial adoption. So, you know, when you visit, have the chance to to visit the the the, the, uh, the Carrara uh, quarries, which which is one of the most beautiful places on earth is that you, you will see these beautiful, beautiful machines in action. So here you have an image of the, uh, the 19th century idea of the architect, how we would operate in the year 2000. So, you know, I, uh, I did my little contribution, hopefully. <laughs> but Frank Lloyd Wright had something wonderful to say uh, about this. Uh, so here's a quote from his uh, auto, autobiography. If I was to realize new buildings, I should have to have new technique. I should have to do to so design buildings that they would not only be appropriate to materials, but design them so that the machine that would uh, have to make them could make them surpassingly well. And I think that quote really underscores that you know, this false schism between engineering and, and design, right? Is that it's perfectly reasonable uh, um, when ro robotics are becoming such a force to also uh, approach it with a, with a, uh, with a design background. Um, but I also wanna underscore is that, you know, I think it's incredibly important that, that you see industrial uptake uh, of this technology, right? It needs to, have an impact, and in that sense, you know, I'm 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 really on the uh, on the edge of of being involved in academia in and in, in industry, right? I mean, um, the thing is that uh, this domain is really broad, right? Is that so? When thinking of of robotics, we we shouldn't shy away uh, from uh, the, the realm of, of geometry realization, right? So I was thinking, how, how were I to, to, uh, to cut such a roof, right? Imagine this a factory roof of 40 by 40 uh, meters, uh, right? Quite, a, quite substantial, 1600 square meters. How would you, how would you go about uh, foam cutting this, right? So what you need to to do, what makes sense is to 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 have a, uh, a clear geometric understanding of this. So what I, my my approach here was to to think of an axis, right? The axis of a sphere is a point. The axis of a cylinder is a is a is a line, right? Um, so the the yellow line that you see here is is what's called a topological skeleton. So think of this as a two-dimensional figure, you know, 2D is a, is a, is a curve embedded in three-dimensional space. So it's, it's like if you, uh, it's the thinnest possible version of a shape, right? So if you start adding layer by layer by layer, you're, you're reconstructing uh, the original shape. So you're, you're pushing uh, from this yellow line back to the, back to, back to the boundary, right? So another way of phrasing this is that the yellow line is the, the maximum distance from the, from, from the border, right? The same way that, uh, you know, on a cylinder, uh, the line is equidistant 
the axis of the of the line of a cylinder uh, is equidistant to uh, its its surface, right? In, in the same sense, this yellow line that you see here is equidistant to the to the bore of the of the of the surface. So this kind of rationalization is really an architectural task, right? It has aspects of design motivations, but it also has aspects of uh, of architectural, of engineer, right, of, of fabrication. And when you address those holistically, simultaneously, I think much more interesting results can can be observed. And this is almost uh, uh, um, an, an anachronistic view on architecture, right, harking back to the to the to the to the to the Renaissance. Um, so here you see the, the result of this kind of logic, right, is that where uh, the segmentation, the logic of segmentation of how to chop up these foam blocks to constitute such an, such an architectural pavilion is really a key driver for, its, uh, for, this, for this architectural conception, right. Um, so this was still in the early days, and you see that the foam cutting was uh, the, the manufacturing was not not top notch, right? Uh, in the sense that if we would produce it now, it would be fairly seamless. But the seams are, in fact, what I also find beautiful of this design, right? Is that the segmentation is such an architectural quality here. So. Um, it's a, it, in that sense, I think this is a, a wonderful and interesting time to, to, uh, to revisit the, the role of the architect, right? So on the right, you have Brunelleschi, the architect of the drama that, uh, that I adore. And he spent his life uh, as a practitioner on the, uh, uh, on the construction side of the, of the, of the drama. Simultaneously, right? I mean, also in the Renaissance, uh, an architect like uh, Alberti tried to remove himself and uh, from the from the construction side and become, you know, he was arguably the most the, the first theoretical architect. While um, so, this is becoming a false schism, right? You can be a theoretical practitioner and a practical uh, theoretician in, in architecture. And it's, you know, that's, that's really what I'm, I'm, I'm triggered about, right? This really working on the, uh, on the spear point of, of this divide. Um, sometimes we, we lead to, to novel ideas uh, uh, simply by, by frustration. So we we're invited to, to tender for the, uh, for the production of, of formwork. Uh, for, for an incredibly beautiful bridge designed by Swartzen and, and Janspa. And this, uh, in the end, we didn't get to build it, but I mean, this was one of those key uh, projects driving the technology for, for, for a decade. Um, so while tendering for that, uh, for, the, for the construction of this formwork for this bridge, I realized that, you know, this double curve, we we can't really approximate it with a with a straight wire, right? We need to need to slightly bend this wire because the the radi of the of the surface here are quite, you know, quite vast, are four or five meters in a sense, right? So you just need to bend it a little bit to to perfectly approximate the form. So we lost the tender because we we couldn't do that at the moment, but the fr the the frustration also, uh, you know, set me on a, on a route. Uh, of addressing this problem. So we started to develop methodologies uh, that bend the, the blade such that we can, you know, cut double curved uh, surfaces at a, at a truly disruptive price point, right? Um, so really think, um, in a sense, you know, when you, when you have orthogonal geometry, you know, we, we know the price point. Um, when when it's single ruled, right? Uh, we can do that at, at at an effective cost, but you know that was not before this hot blading cut, uh, methodology. It was just extraordinarily expensive to do so. But you know this this uh, kind of a, a revolutionary uh, methodology. Uh, I think at the same time. 
practically at the same time, my, my uh, partner in uh, Easy City, Philippe Morel, set up a, uh, a company called Xtree, which is, which is still one of the, the leading uh, companies in, uh, in uh, concrete printing in, in Europe. Um, so while my interest was more in subtractive methodologies, uh, X3, Philippe and, and X3 um, spearheaded the development of these uh, concrete print, print additive methodologies, uh, also really at an, uh, at, a, at an industrial scale. So we re really moved from, from being an uh, avant-garde architectural office to really engaging with, with industry. And uh, something that was in the end somewhat frustrating of working in the realm of formworks is that you're constructing something that is transient, right? If you're, if you're working in, uh, with, with concrete, you're building the, the building twice, right? So with, with uh, timber formworks, right? You, you construct a transient, uh, shapes to that allow you to cast in the in, in the concrete. You're, you're you're effectively building the building twice. So the, the the frustrating aspect is there is that as a as a producer of formwork, you're constructing the you know the the you're being the support act. So effectively, what you're making disappears, and in the end, that's you know that did get a, a little bit old. Um, so in 2017. Um, I started as as a CTO at uh, at Actual, and at Actual we are more interested in um, becoming a um, both a designer and producer of architectural products, right? So these these the the, the product that, that is building quite a bit of traction are our three D three D printed floors, but we are also creating uh, staircases, uh, brisolai, facade panels. So here there's more of an integration between the, the end product and the methodology of, of, uh, of its production. In this case, these, these uh, very, very large uh, robot driven uh, 3D printers. Um, so actually it was a spin out of, uh, spin off of this architect's which, which was in the Netherlands, one of the, the first offices to engage with, uh, with large scale 3D, 3D printing. That methodology, did, did, that initial approach did not really scale up to, to industrial, uh, industrial production. So rather than developing our own motion platform, you know, we simply focused on the, uh, the, the extruder technology and uh, simply started to use these, these um, uh, powerful ABB robots, which I've been, been working with for, for a long time. So what's something I'm, I'm quite proud of is, uh, for instance, this, this video that, uh, that one of my co-workers sent me the other day. And, you know, we are, we are really achieving a kind of beach hypothesis at, uh, at actual. So at the end of the day, uh, during the day, we were, we're, we're doing prototype development. We're, we're thinking of, of new, new products to, to, to develop. We're, we're tuning the, the production. Uh, but it's really through the night that most of the, the production takes, takes place, right? So this, in, in robotics, this is known as, as lights out uh, production. As you can see, it's not, uh, not completely lights out, right? There's this kind of green light in the in the background that's mostly from the status light uh, lights of the of the robots themselves so green is uh, you know means that everything is going going fine so we are producing uh, these kind of panels 24 7 through the night through the through the weekends recently we've we've produced uh 50 square about 50 square meters of acoustic panels uh, in collaboration with uh, Gramatio and uh, and code and again these these machines are just churning churning through the night so in that sense we take it incredibly serious right i mean uh we're, we're not trying to horse around but really 
uh, build towards a, a, a situation where the, the production of these, these uh, architectural products is fairly autonomous. Um, Conversely, we, are, we also want to make it more accessible to the consumer uh, of architects, architecture to engage with architecture. So I, I guess most of the audience is, is, is uh, knowledgeable of, of parametric design, right? Um, where you can generate tailored designs very, fairly, fairly easily. Um, and with with digital, uh, with actual, we're really focused on on the entire pipeline, right? So if you sign up on our on our website, you can tailor uh, tailor and customize these these products, order them, and then they are integrated in our in our uh, ERP, our in, uh, uh, enterprise resource uh, planning software, and um, we are building a, a distributed. Uh, factory, right, such that the production of, uh, of these elements are not necessarily taking place only in our workshop in Amsterdam, but can be easily distributed throughout, throughout the world. We are working with partners to, to set up these, these joint venture production, production sites. So here the fabrication technology is really enabling designers and builders to, to make the most of tailor-made tailor uh, architecture by making it both more, more accessible, uh, but also by, by driving the, the price point uh, downwards. The thing is that uh, architecture is poorly distributed, right? 95% uh, of, the, of the built environment is, is produced without the intervention of, uh, of architects. And in that sense, there's, a, there's an entire world for us out there where we can uh, uh, push, um, push, push uh, where, we, where actual projects can, can engage. The thing is that if you want to do something interesting in architectural uh, pro product, you, the certification, uh, the validation of a product is uh, so uh, capital and time intensive. It needs to be almost there. It needs to be at your fingertips. And that's playlist of architectural elements is really what we, what we provide at, uh, at actual. And I think there might be an interesting analogy for the, for the mass timber industry here is that, um, you know, if you, um, I think that, that, that almost draws back to the automotive uh, re revolution, right? I mean, if you ask clients what they, what they would have liked to have seen uh, with, when the uh, revolution of the combustion engine ensued was a, you know, a horse carriage with a, with a, with a, with an internal combustion motor, right? Um, so in that sense, we cannot always operate in a supply driven, uh, in a demand driven fashion. So actual, operates much more in a supply driven driven fashion. So in architecture, we're kind of used to, to be fairly passive until the, the, the a client ap approaches us and then we get to work, right? So with actual, we really do, do, the, do the inverse. So we try to develop the, the very, very, very best product that we think uh, is necessary, that we think is, beautiful that we think is the best that we can can deliver um, so there's there's also this aspect of of trying to be supply driven and i think that that meshes well together with the approach of being uh, product product driven in architecture if you want to look at it a bit a bit cynical you could say that you know you're you're at a premium. You're you're delivering alpha or at best beta beta quality, right? So you need a kind of momentum to sustain the the development of of such product, right? To um, because people 
your 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 clients, your customers, they are demanding the a premium, right? The 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 very very best. So interesting enough, the very first project that that we delivered with actual was a uh, a floor installed at uh, probably not for sure actually the busiest airport in uh, uh, in Europe uh, at Schiphol in uh, in Amsterdam. So you know since our first uh, installation, all the other floors have seen far far less intense use than. Uh, than the one we, we uh, initially installed at, at Ship Hall, so you know that was that was quite a quite a quite a move. Here you also see uh, the design interest that that this product can bring, right? So we've integrated uh, wayfinding patterns in the in the design of the the floor. So rather than you know all of these. Uh, um, signages guiding you explicit you know take a left go right go forward uh you're you're guided through through the airport in a more far more subliminal way right um so in that sense it's also quite a quite a functional uh product that i would say and you know in ship hall there's these hundreds of thousands of square meters of undifferentiated uh uh, ceramic tile floors, right? So through this product, the floor has become, you know, an almost infinite architectural canvas, and that really has a, has a. So I don't think it's a marginal product in in that sense, right? It it really opens up uh, vast uh, vast possibilities. Um, so one of the after the the ship hall floor, another highlight uh, that we produced was for the for the uh, BMW head, uh, headquarters in Munich. Um, so we installed this this beautiful uh, floor at the at the showroom there. So quite a quite a you know like like um, ship hall, quite a quite a prestigious uh, project in a in a sense. Um, this project was done together with uh, with, a, with Patricia Urquiola, who's a very famous uh, interior uh, architect, a really world class class designer. And in a sense, right, is that so? I think there's almost kind of the, the combined authorship there, right? There's the the the, um, the uh, a product that is already somewhat developed by actual and taken to the to the next level by by designer such as uh, Patricia Urquiola, right? So in terms of design, there's also enough room for such a product to to breathe and to be adapted by uh, by world class architects. So that is that is very uh, satisfying. Uh, recently, we also installed a floor that recycles some uh, some of the uh, yeah well known uh, <laughs> Dutch beer brand, I, I would say. So the infill of the floor is uh, re reuses recycles both the the plastic of the uh, of the crates that we use for the three D printing and uh, also the the infill uh, the glass uh, utilizes a glass info for that for that floor so that's that's quite beautiful these are some uh, concept stores we've produced for for nike uh, for so i think that's um just a moment i'm, I'm gonna make a the the make a bit more light here i, I see that you hardly can see my my face anymore just you know the evening is 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 setting in in here in, uh, in Amsterdam. So I think in that sense, with actual really doing away with this schism versus uh, of architecture versus engineering, you know, of um, and and taking on a, a proactive role in how these new methodologies, how robotics can really uh, 
breathe new air into the, the, the profession of architecture. We are also creating, exploring a, a, a new business model that is, that is tied, tied to that. You know, where I, I don't think that the, the, the more passive model of waiting, you know, where you, the more demand driven model is becoming quite, quite problematic uh, in, in architecture both in terms of the, the, the quality of the, of the product, uh, right? It, it, you, need, you need volume to keep developing. Uh, you need to be able to, to iterate on these uh, projects to, to reach uh, a, high, a high level, right? So you, and in, in traditional architectural practice, it's very, very challenging to uh, arrive at, at such a rhythm where you can keep on iterating and where you can keep on refining and, and pushing the technology and the, the, and the product forward. Um, a project that I'm also really proud of um, uh, and I think is exemplary in, in terms of process is uh, the one for, for flagship store of Nike in, uh, in London, in, in Oxford Street. So um, what, what was so interesting in this project is that, you know, the, the, from the initial impetus, from the initial ID to installation, we delivered this product. And mind you, you know, this is Oxford Street is like, that is the concept store of, of Nike in, uh, in, in, in Europe. Like it's, it's quite something. So it took six weeks from the initial sketch from uh, the, the incredible, I mean, Nike employs an internal, uh, incredibly high-end uh, design office. And in, in tandem with the with designers of Nike, we developed this, this, uh, this, this project. Um, so that really riffs off the, the texture of the, the woven materials we wanted to express that in these in these panels. These panels is kind of an extension of the of the design of the of the of the fabric of these of these shoes, right? And the wonderful thing is that you know a company like like Nike is that uh, that they are approaching us for these for these kind of uh, very bespoke. Hold on a second, this is a bit a bit loud for these very bespoke projects, but also is that, you know, it's um, six weeks is not that long for a design process, right? But for six weeks for the, the conception and installation, there's, you know, there's not that many outfits that, uh, that can do that. And in that sense, I think there's a, there's a takeaway or perhaps an analogy of what we are doing at, at Actual to, uh, to the evolving mass timber industry in the, in the US is that I think uh, it is really worthwhile to explore a, a, uh, a product oriented strategy um, towards, towards architecture, right? We are reinventing the wheel all too often, uh, harking back at traditional models all too often. And I get back to the, the carriage, uh, internal combustion engine versus uh, carriage met metaphor again, right? Is that I think also being passive and just waiting uh, for consumers to phrase what they want is insufficient, right? Nobody asked for the internal combustion engine, right? But it, uh, the, the, the Fordian revolution was a, was a glaring success, right? And, there wasn't a market demand for the electrification of, um, um, of, of the automotive industry, right? That, that industry really uh, pulled, it, pulled, it, uh, pulled it itself up from its, by its own hairs, right? The uh, Munchausen move. And in that sense, that's, that's something that we are really, really engaged with. Um, Yale, can I can I uh, grab you an opportunity for a moment? This is part of my sales pitch to have you uh, open a shop in Oregon. 
And, you know, we're going to call it Geeks Beer Wooden Robots. And we'll put a brewery on the base and then we'll have you there. We need more robots. But I, I want to mention Nike because the Nike supported at the University of Oregon of 500,000. No, I can't even remember. A massive, massive building. I won't quote the number. That's Mass Timber. And that's all supporting innovation and sustainability at the University of Oregon. Right. We also, we also worked on a Nike bridge um, that was really innovative. But that's another area where maybe... This crosses over all of the work in robotics, design, branding, and all of that wood we have in Oregon. It would be great. And not to give all credit to only Nike, um, the new Adidas headquarters in Portland, Oregon, that we worked on is also an expansion of massive mass timber building. So these worlds are colliding. Um, keep keep yeah. that in mind. Okay, keep, yeah. Please continue, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think those comments are, are, are very apt. And um, I mean, business-wise, I think doing this in construction is maybe even more challenging. You know, with actual, we're focusing, our focus is at the moment more tending toward the fit-out industry rather than construction. Uh, also, because the liability is more manageable, or more reasonable, the margins are a little bit higher. And... You know, also in retail, you know, perhaps uh, in a in a building seats, you know, maybe maybe six, eight, nine fit outs in tw in two or three decades, right? So the the turnover in the fit out industry is is higher than in construction, right? I mean, it's 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 you're 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 talking about ten of hundreds of years, and you know, with fit out. Uh, Stores are revamped every every three to four years or so. I mean, obviously, for, uh, with an airport, uh, and we are at the moment also in talks to to install a vast floor in the, in the Portland uh, airport. So, so that would be uh, we would be exciting. Um, yeah, you, you also mentioned sustainability. Um, we've explored that also in a number of projects is where we re reutilize industrial ways to, to repurpose that uh, in, in our products. So these, the, uh, for instance, this, this roof, uh, roof design we installed was in, printed in entirely from re recycled, uh, recycled plastic. And, you know, also companies our clients really tap into uh, that. Really, also triggers our, our clients, right? This this question of of marketing, corporate uh, uh, responsibility, sustainability. It it that 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 I think we've really gelled that into a very very potent uh, potent mix. That said, is that I think this I I'm, I'm clawing back to that idea of architecture being poorly distributed, right? Is that um, I think through these revolutionary methodologies that, that we are all so engaged in, I think we can really broaden out uh, the market for architecture, right? I mean, it is, it is too narrow, it is too, too expensive. Um, so I think, you know, is that these these technological innovations, being able to to adapt these designs online, being able to, to order them from a from a tiny startup in the, in the, in Amsterdam, it really subscribes to the disruptive power of these methodologies, and I mean that both in in terms of software design, being able to, you know create such, such customizers uh, online and, and also make that an interesting experience. Um, so in a sense, we are really building upon the foundation of the revolution in both hardware and, and software. Um, I think it's also important to underscore that we are not only focused on uh, on 3D printing, you know, uh, as it is a, a technology that we've we've built in house. Um, at this phase of the company, it makes a lot of sense because we have a lot of control of our products. Uh, you know, we we don't have the the scale and the, the turnover of uh, of integrating 
uh, endless uh, amounts of of, uh, uh, of integrating various uh, fabrication methodology, but you know this is something that we are that we are working towards and following uh, next funding rounds we, we we will totally address this and you know as our uh, portfolio of materials. Uh, that we can address through our platform increases, our market uh, reach will, 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 also, will also increase. And hopefully through this, what I anticipate is that through, uh, through this evolution of working from, you know, um, from floors to shading devices to facades, is that we can claw our way back to back to construction in a sense, right? That is um, that that is our horizon in you know five to five to five to fifteen years. That that could that could uh, take a while. So I hope uh, that my presentation has uh, given you some some food for thought for rethinking the possibilities and how. I think the, I hope the takeaway for, for our audience is going to be how, how this technology really is the trigger for novel thinking in terms of, of our economy, right? I mean, it is a means to, to an end. And I think that that is maybe a quality that that's, uh, sets actual apart, right? Is that I think we address uh, our approach is kind of holistic in that sense, right? There's aspects of design, there's aspects of marketing, there's aspects of manufacturing, there's aspects of uh, being online, online platform. We try to do a lot simultaneously. So, you know, that's, that's also incredibly, incredibly fun. And um, it's also that Europe is investing a lot in, in uh, you know, the, the education is incredible. The, you know what's been going on at the ETH at the groups of Gramatio Keller, of, of Philip Block, of Benjamin Dillon Berger. It's it's world class research that is that is taking place there. Also here at the Technical University of Delft um, in London in the in the Bartlett at the, at the AA. So we're a bit privileged having the the research uh, at the academia and having the the, the talented. Uh, designers close you know in close prox proximity mm, a product that we are I, I i didn't mention this so far but i think in a sense you know what's interesting about this staircase product that we are that we are working towards is that this is already already becoming a bit more ambivalent right i mean a floor is clearly fit out right but uh, a staircase it, it has already such structural qualities that it's a bit ambivalent is it construction does it fit out in the in the fit out industry? Yeah, so that's that's what I mean also by clawing our way back to back to construction. Um, uh, Yale, we've got a question from Stefan, if I can. Ah, terrific. Okay. Um, he said, "Where do you see applications of that specifically in the timber industry?" And he said, "Today, most everything is milling, CNC, and some robotics." Are you aware of anybody using similar technologies for wood and mass timber? And he said, I'm thinking of 3D printing of wood fiber products. Yeah, uh, we, use we, of bandsaw, yeah. We, we are exploring that actually, uh, the use of, uh, and it's, it's uh, I think one of the most promising uh, material developments that, that I've seen over the last uh, decade even. So it's it's very probable that uh, we are already experimenting and printing with with wooden fibers, and you know I, I can't disclose everything because you know once projects tend to have impact, they also tend to go off the radar because due to uh, non compete and the NDAs uh, etc. But we are now at the status where we where we can additively print material uh, and use traditional uh, carpentry tools to, to post-process them, which is a blessing. Sending plastic ain't no fun. I can assure you that, <laughs> right? And also we are, we are very much dedicated to this, to this uh, uh, 
uh, to sustainability, right? And um, it is also, you know, this is also um, a, a way of repurposing repurposing wood, right? I mean, uh, this is not obviously not a great wood that you that you would use utilize to uh, to create this. Uh, the wooden print print material, right? So these are really secondary uh, resource resource streams and recycled materials, uh, but at a at a, already at a, a, a high level. The other but, thing is that uh, possibly almost a question from me to the mass industry, the timber industry, is that I'm curious how you uh, what your take is on. On approaching, uh, let's say, a product-oriented or strategy, and it's it's you know as a layman, it seems seems somewhat obvious to me because in a sense it has been the the, the wooden house is also associated to to the uh, a catalog, you know, something that you that you I think it's entirely reasonable to buy such a such a package on online. So who knows? Maybe yeah. we can join forces there. <laughs> yeah, I think what I what I'm liking is that you're iterating on the business model, both B to B to B and B to C. So you're involving architecture and then marketing directly to yeah. consumers. We're seeing some more of that now with some of the configuration development, but it's still very, very early days. Yeah. And uh, what I would ask you to can we, we've experimented with Fanuc Industrial Robot and also now a KUKA. Uh, yeah. But like, like for you uh, around, for example, Michigan, there are many warehouses with used robots that you can buy inexpensively. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the question becomes, with all the building demand, we can get inexpensive robots, but the constraint point is programming them, having people yeah. like you. And is there enough volume? Because it's so expensive to do only bespoke projects that require a lot of custom coding for a single project. How do we get to volume? Can I, can I push back on that a little bit? Because Please. I think that is that is no longer true anymore. I mean, with actual, we, we never reprinted the same part twice, right? I mean, everything we do is custom, but, uh, you know, we have an industrial routine in, in, in this uh, bespoke manufacturing, right? So the thing is that it is, somewhat the scope is a little bit limited right those are 3d printed uh, uh, products I'm, I'm, I'm speaking of right so to achieve that that kind of industrial routine for instance in in wire sawing stone would would take some uh, would take years of the development not infinite but one or two years probably but I mean I think I, sh I, I showed quite convincingly in a sense with the with the lights out production that that we that this is achievable, this is uh, in our in our reach. And um, I also, you know, I've disclosed that I'm a fan of the ETH, right? Uh, something to, that I would uh, encourage the audience to, to look into is that the ETH has been uh, culminating its research in a, in a very promising framework called Compass. Um, so, you know, so much of the of the PhD uh, works, so much of the uh, uh, the research work is culminating in these uh, open source packages that that really considerably lowers the the threshold to uh, for software development in in house. Right? I mean, we have finite resources at actual. We are uh, two or three persons. So, uh, working on the on the hardware and the and the, and the, the print installations, right? It's it's also doable, right? Is that let's let's not be intimidated. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, hey, you, you know I'm a believer. I'm a believer in affordable mass customization. Uh, yeah. The potentials there. And regarding ETH, we have Daniel Hall speaking on industrialized construction on Monday. Yes. Fabian Scheuer, design to production. Incredible. So we're, bring, we're bringing that in, and then I think we're going to do an event at ETH in January uh, yeah. 2020. So we're trying, but we need more people like you uh, that essentially are interested in architecture and the means and methods. 
of manufacturing? You know, in a sense, in, in Europe, I think the, the, the market is somewhat conservative uh, yeah. for housing. And so in a sense, you know, you need early adapters to, to be willing to, uh, to engage with su such a product, right? And I think for, for our fit out products, the, the risk is very manageable in a sense, right? But for a house that's already a bit more ambitious, but I think for a single family house, come on. I mean, when you iterate on, a, on the number of these, uh, of these instances, you know, I think the, the upswing is far, far out, outweighs the, the risk. I mean, it's just obvious that, that we need to, to, to work in, in that direction. And the thing is that the other important thing is that uh, I mean, it's a cliche, of course, to refer to to Apple, but uh, so, sorry for doing that. But design is key. Design is important, right? So I really, you know, I really get depressed when I see the potential of these. I'm a Hundedegger admirer. You know this, Greg. <laughs> I, I haven't stopped raving uh, about I'm very impressed at the at the technology technological level at the presentation yesterday. It's, it's mind blowing. That is clear and obvious. The thing is that what what just I go berserk seeing these these extremely conservative uh, 19th century chalets uh, being produced with the state of the state of the art of the of the technology. So, right, this is your industry, internal combustion engine at the horse carriage, right? It's, it's, too, it's too conservative. It, the match of the technology of what it can express and then reverting back to the old models is a, is a travesty. You know, we, we, need, to, we need to move, uh, accelerate and, and move beyond that. So, I, yeah, it's, it's, and I think in a sense, um, you know, is that yesterday also in the, the, the presentation of Wolf, we saw the importance of, of volume, right? Is that um, I think it's also for smaller shops, uh, for, for smaller uh, shops, that this is also a way to claw uh, towards greater volume, right? Is that once you start iterating, the, the risk of, of the, the product you're putting out there becomes much more manageable. The, the, the reduction in cost uh, is substantial. The routine of the, uh, of the plant is, is getting there. It's, uh, it's, it's fantastic in a sense, right? It's, so it's, it's been, a, been a wild ride in, in that sense for the, the uh, for the last couple of years, and we really are building a, up to a momentum in, uh, in actual. But again, I mean, fit out is, is perhaps e an, an easier point of uh, point of the departure. But, uh, in that sense, I, I wish there was, you know. But I think your industry is also being heavily invested with with the Cateras, and uh, you know, is is it, it's quite a revolutionary moment. But it's also a bit shocking to see is that in terms of construction, things are becoming very, very uh, standardized in a sense, right? So I think there's also a need for more actual uh, products in a sense to make, make those fairly standard uh, cells uh, a, a bit more interest, interesting. So it seems that, you know, there's a bit of polarization going on where, there, you know, in, in terms of, uh, expenditure, uh, there's more going to fit out and increasingly less to, uh, uh, to the actual construction itself. And, okay. and you know, that's, that's maybe a bit of a global observation. Well, I'll, I'll ask for some more um, questions. And pardon, actually they're mowing the lawn outside of my, <laughs> so that background noise. But I, I think a good thing about the US market is we have the technology companies and their campuses. They can't get enough buildings and they can't build fast enough. And all of the technology companies are doing increasingly innovative architecture at a massive scale and hiring world-class architects, as you know. So that's one opportunity. Another opportunity is again, back at the single family home. 
yeah. how do we how do we iterate on that and make good design compelling architecture more affordable by applying more automation yeah but i mean i i think you your uh, the answer perhaps already lies in your in your question right i mean what I find problematic uh, in architecture is that it's it's highly under democratic, right? I mean, it's really sort of a bourgeois niche architecture, right? So, what if you what if you engage with world class architects and utilize their skills to move beyond the the hor uh, horse carriage internal combustion mo uh, you know point in time and and broaden up the market for for architecture. I mean, even if it's a, a small hut in somebody's backyard, right? I mean, if you do a couple of hundred of those, you, you, that that would be already a way to to enter the market. Maybe the the family house is already a, a, a bit ambitious, but a holiday house, right? You're, you can, you can perhaps uh, be more risky there. I think sort of the 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 branding, the marketing of. Uh, value the design value of architecture there is also quite quite applicable so I think, thinking out loud that's that's how we would go about it well please please do think out loud that's kind of what we want to make happen or help be a part of that have design competition where you're building building systems the right. one thing the one thing we really do have in the u.s is scale scale of demand we need Absolutely. millions of units and yeah. currently when one of people want to buy a a, a, a bespoke home. The process is years. It takes a really long time and it's intimidating to a lot of people. And there's so many unknowns. If you could make it a more predictable process, so it was more efficient and people could purchase homes designed by architects that were efficient to manufacture, that's to me the holy grail. And no one's, yeah. no, that hasn't happened yet here in the US. I mean, exactly. And I, I think so. You know, the, I, I really invite everybody in the audience also to check out, you know, our platform is, is open. It's, uh, please sign up and, and come and check it out. It, it can be a, an interesting analogy for, for your industry. And what I mean with that is that the ambition with actual is that, you know, the delivery of architectural products uh, traditionally is quite, it's quite a stressful, uh, stressful ride usually, right? I mean, if you want to have ambitious architecture, is that uh, unintentionally, you know, an ulcer is <laughs> is delivered with the, with the package sometimes, right? I mean, it is is a, it is a stressful industry in in that sense, right? So the more there's a correlation between the architectural ambition and and stress involved, and it does not need to be that way as long as you can create volume, as long as you can can iterate uh, that. And I think that is really an achievement that we've reached with actual, right? Two years ago with Chippo, it was was not nothing to install such a such a floor on such a site. But now, you know, we shrug our shoulders and we do it routinely. We don't even think about it anymore, right? And um, yeah, so start start modestly, but this is going to happen, Greg. I mean, the the economics are such that, for, yeah, it's it's almost certain it's. It's a given for me in a sense, right? I mean, that's maybe my professional deformation there speaking, but <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a believer, right? Yeah, um, I, I, I am and have been for many years. The market demand is there, the, the need for housing, the wood, the technology is there, and we can iterate on that. It's just how do you how do you put that all together and realize it? And I think I don't think even fearing competition is the challenge. The demand is so great. And people want such diversity that competition kind of validates what's possible. No, but I mean, here I have to salute you, Greg, because I, I mean, in our industry, I think you are one of the, the few who is constantly crossing the divide between uh, doing a much better job <laughs> than, than myself. I, I wish, I, wish I, I, I was as active as you crossing the divide between the U.S. and the and the and the European markets, right? Because I think we maybe we are a bit uh, more advanced in terms of integration of the, the architectural conception and these novel fabrication, uh, you know, this kind of culture of fabrication and architectural design. But we miss, we, 
the, the, the market, especially for construction, is, is too conservative and uh, just not, not large enough, right? I mean, you, you need early adapters and the, the greater your market is, it's just very simple, it's statistics, right? The greater your market, the more early adapters you, you will have. And uh, the US is far less conservative, uh, far more optimistic, uh, progressive and, and uh, forward looking. So I'm, I think, yeah, you're in a, you're in a good, good position. But I think it's exactly this this work you are you are doing of of tying this this divide uh, to uh, especially through com and that's why these conferences uh, such a such as this ones are are so exciting right I'm I'm really stoked for that honestly okay. yeah well you, you know I have a Swiss business partner and a Finnish wife and I do believe this can happen faster and create more opportunities for everyone. If we, if we just do it, if we get the right people working together and prove what's possible. Absolutely. No, you, you embody this. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Cool. Well, well, we need the people like you to implement it, do it and iterate and build. But um, is there any, any more questions from the audience? I know it's, it's been a lot to digest, but great stuff from, uh, from Yele. Oh, and Yele, let me, like, can you ask if people want to track you, find you, be in contact, learn more, how do they... What do you recommend they do? Uh, shoot me an email. So that's that's my name, Jelle, J-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, at actual.com. And actual is spelled A-E-C-T-U-A-L. You, you see it uh, top left at the, at the, at the screen. Yeah, Beautiful. So come and check us out. Great. What I'll do is I'll, um, of course, uh, put the video up with your kind of information, put it on the Mass Timber website, and I hope you have time to also engage as everyone else in continuing these conversations just to kind of make these things happen faster. No, absolutely. I mean, I mean I, I'm super stoked for this, for this co uh, uh, conference. This is, this is wild stuff, Greg. Thank, okay. Thanks so much for the, for the invite. And I, I'm, I'm really, I feel really honored and, and privileged to, to address this audience. I mean, it's not obvious to invite me in a sense, right? I'm not a domain specialist in, uh, in mass timber. And, and hopefully uh, the, I can provide your audience with, with some kind of analogy. Uh, but to make the most of that, I, I think the audience <laughs> has to do a bit of processing on, on there and uh, as, All right. as well. <laughs> well, and I ask you, I'll leave you with this thought. When we have that mass timber innovation cluster in Oregon, what, what's the order of the words when the geeks would beer and robots? I mean, what, you're the branding guy, so how do we... <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I mean, frankly, I think this is a very, very serious question. And I think more existential almost, I think it, as architects, we've lost so much of, of our audience, right? And I think such, such a platform would be incredible for re-engaging with, with, this, with this audience, right? And that's why, why I'm, again, uh, I'm, I'm a believer of you know, small sheds, single family houses, this can be a, a driving force for distributing architectural uh, to, a, to a much broader and, and, and wider, wider audience. So, so I come again and again, I, I, this is really in my fibers, I, I come back to that, uh, to that question. And design is, I think we need to utilize design to, to, to crack to crack the nut, right? To move uh, away out of the kind of conservative rut where we're stuck in a, a little bit, right? The, the time is there, the technology is there, the confidence is there. We can do it. Well, well thank you. Uh, I, I, I share your view and your optimism or passion or obsession, whatever you want to call it. But um, yeah, excited about making it happen. Uh, thank you. and. Uh, We'll talk soon and st please stay engaged. And thank you, audience, as well. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Greg. Yep. All right. Goodbye.